Hello and welcome to this edition of uh, International Relations with Professor Pushpesh Pant. We curate this uh, episode, these episodes to be precise, for you, those who are aspiring to qualify for the civil service examinations. We take a look at whatever is happening in the world around us. We also try to assess how it's going to impact on our foreign policy, its formulation and implementation, and ultimately how our national interest is going to be affected. In short, our view is all perspective is always endocentric, but this doesn't mean that we are blind to the realities, harsh realities of the international relations stage. The changing power equations, the conflict of interest between the big powers, at one time there are two superpowers, but right now they are not equally matched. We also look at the aspirations of the regional powers and we try to put it in a perspective, a historical perspective, and look ahead a little in the future. We try to provide for you the PDF, which gives you the background. So let's see what we have for you this time. We are going to look at the conflict which has taken the world by surprise, so to speak, while the world's attention was focused on Ukraine and the Russian intervention in Ukraine or the Chinese expansion in the East Asian region. Uh, suddenly, a violent conflict broke out in Sudan. And Sudan has always been considered a basket case, an emerging human tra humanitarian tragedy for great magnitude. But this time, people thought that for the past two, three years, there was a lull, but little did people know that it was a lull before the storm, and this happened. Then what is interesting is that then the India has been uh, busy organizing a series of meetings as a run-up uh, to the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting, two important summits. One summit, of course, was uh, India was trying to do was the G20 summit, and the run-up to that was also preparatory, so to speak, of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Now, the need to look at Shanghai Cooperation Organization is great, because since the war in Ukraine, the Russian aggression in Ukraine, the whole geopolitical scenario has changed, and Russia and China have come closer, and India's expectations that China and Russia would help uh, Pakistan behave itself vis-a-vis -vis India has totally been turned topsy-turvy. These can be not considered as realistic uh, expressions. Uh, so we would like to have a look at that also. We would also like to look at whatever is happening elsewhere, uh, like in Latin American continent, uh, President Lula, since he has taken over, he is aspiring to um, project himself as the leader of what might be called a new non-line movement. How valid are his claims? Can he succeed in doing so? What is the significance of Brazil in contemporary international relations? That's important. And this again is not unrelated to whatever is happening on the uh, global stage. He visited uh, China and made statements that uh, China should mediate uh, and bring peace back to uh, Ukraine. The Russians immediately welcomed his statements. Everybody in the West thought that he was betraying the Western world. Uh, there is no reason to believe that Lula should remain loyal uh, ally of the Western world. He he probably is the senior most leader in the on the continent of Latin America. And if, even if you look at the global stage, he is a he was a leader in his own right before uh, quite before Putin emerged in Russia, or she had emerged in China, or Mr. Modi had emerged in India. So that these are the issues which we want to discuss with you this time. And let's begin with the Sudan conflict, first of all. To understand the violence of Sudan, we have to see that Sudan is the third largest country by area in on the African continent, and it shares the its boundaries, uh, not shares its body, but shares its boundaries with many countries in Central African Republic to the southwest, Chad to the west, Egypt to the north, Eritrea to the northeast, Ethiopia to the southeast, Libya to the northwest, South Sudan to the south, and opens out on the Red Sea. Now, Sudan is a country through which the Blue Nile flows through. So it flows upwards, and Egypt is dependent for its fresh water supply on the 
on the Nile flowing through Sudan. Sudan has, because of the same Nile, a special relationship or a conflict situation with Eritrea. Because uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia, Ethiopia ever since it declared uh, the grandiose Rena Renaissance Dam project is going to affect the flow of water and not all parties, all riparian parties are going to be equally benefited by this. So there is this conflict. Uh, there is another issue there. Uh, Sudan has been undergoing some kind of a uh, oppressive regime for more than 30 years. There was Omar Hassan Ahmad al-Bashir, a dictator who served as the seventh head of Sudan since its independence, but was in power between 1989 to almost 2019. So you have these 33 decades when he was uh, the unchallenged ruler of Sudan. He worked autocratically, he opportunistically allied with different powers uh, on the global stage, but he was ousted in 2019 and hopes had been raised that Sudan would now at long last have a democratic government. But the, but the so-called revolution was soon betrayed and since then the country has been fought in a civil war and political instability. When Bashir was in power, there was a most atrocious genocide perpetrated in Darfur toward the southern part of the southwestern part of the country where millions of uh, people, Sudanese, lost their lives. And this is the region which uh, controls the oil, which controls the mineral resources, but which also has an ethnic divide. You know, Sudan is a very interesting country where it is part, uh, people are partly of Negroid uh, stock, partly of Arab stock, partly of mixed stock, and also there is a religious divide, there is paganism, animism, Christianity, Copt, uh, Copt Christians, and various sects of Islam. Now, so what happened is that by when Bashir was there, the oppression of the people in Darfur resulted in a massive, many millions of refugees uh, leaving Sudan and becoming a burden, so, so to speak, in the neighboring countries. And the neighboring countries, which have a very porous border, uh, would have a complex situation because these Sudanese refugees would settle and encroach on the lands which was being used by the citizens of these different countries. There also is a basic conflict between the agriculturalists and pastoralist people in Africa. And also the boundaries drawn during the colonial period are very, very artificial. So people have been the ties of ethnicity, the ties of clan, the ties of kinship, the ties of ways of life. And of course, the climate change has rendered this a very, very complex problem. Then we come to... Uh, Sudan in 2021, uh, Al Burhan, who had become the chief uh, after the power in the power sharing council, he earlier had been a general. He, he was head of the armed forces of Bashir. Bashir trusted him, but both he and the person who's now uh, the Hamiti, the, the general who heads the uh, rapid supply force, which is which was basically a militia, Janjavidi militia, unleashed on the people of Darfur. And then Bashir had very cleverly, so he thought, tried to play one armed force against the other armed force and to balance them in a manner uh, which ultimately misfired because the two of them, uh, General Burhan and Hamidi, came together to oust and at that stage they said that they would support the people's aspirations to have a democratic rule, but very soon uh, the infighting be, began between these two factions. The major issue was the merger of the rapid supply force, the militia, into the armed forces. And the armed forces obviously would resist this. And again, uh, the ambitions of Hamiti, who was a warlord in the southern region with his militia, he was in control of the mines, the gold mines, the mineral resources, the oil producing areas, and he could, you know, he was allowed to live and let live by Bashir more or less freely. Another feature about the conflict in Sudan is, like in very many countries in, uh, in the third world, Capital, as long as it is isolated from the civil war-like situation in the regions outside, in the provinces, it is happening in Nigeria, it is happening in Chad, it is happening in Mali, it is happening in Burkina Faso, it is happening in Uganda, it is happening, of course, in Ethiopia, it has happened. Now, and we are only focusing at the moment on the African continent. You could say the same about uh, Myanmar, you could say the same about Cambodia as a little earlier. Whenever there is, or, or Philippines for that matter, as long as the capital is safe, the world is 
thinking that the conflict is under control. Now, this is what has blown in the face of everybody in Sudan at the moment. The current fighting broke out between the RSF as a result of negotiations breaking down between the two generals. Now, the army is in control of Khartoum, but in another airport is controlled by the RSF. Uh, as on 15th April uh, 2023, uh, both the leaders, Hamiti Hamdan Dagalu and Sudan's de facto leader and army chief Burhan, claimed control of the strategic positions in the country. But this is not quite true because by now, uh, more than 450 people have lost their lives, of them almost 275 civilians, and thousands have been wounded. Uh, it is almost impossible to move out, according to reports, even in the capital city Khartoum. And the major countries in the world have evacuated their citizens with the help of the army from these places. Now, uh, the history of conflict, as we were discussing, is ethnic, religious, and competition for the resources. Now, the interesting part is this, that whenever the conflict in Sudan is discussed, everybody said is the result of the outside forces interfering here. Now, who's saying this? This is said by the United States of America. This is said by France. This is said by European Union. This is said by the Secretary General of the United Nations. But they forget that the cause of the conflict is interference by outside powers in Sudan. Obviously, United States doesn't view itself as an outside power anywhere else. It, it thinks this is a global policeman. Uh, General De Gaulle used to say that U.S. suffers from the um, psychosis of being a global gendarme with the global policeman. And also the United Nations working under the influence of uh, United States for the most part is of the view that it is trying to uh, maintain peace. It is trying to restore peace. But of course, whoever played the piper calls for the tune, whether there is the IMF, whether there's the peacekeeping forces of the United Nations, the UN, uh, United States plays an important role. Now, similarly, uh, when United States interfered under the following the doctrine of regime change in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, in Afghanistan, uh, it thought that there was no outside interference. But right now, when there is uh, the mercenary force of Wagner, uh, thinly disguised, paid by Putin, Russian militia, it becomes an outside influence. If there are the Sudanese mercenaries who are recruited to find uh, the forces of General Haftar, the rebel general in the, who controls the southern part of Libya and the oil producing areas there, it is supposed to be outside interference. The inter interesting part is this, that even the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, the point is that in Egypt, what had happened was when where Sisi is in power, the Muslim Brotherhood again crushed the popular rebellion, the residual Arab Spring, and restored the old regime in a more autocratic fashion. So people in this area, when, when there is a fighting in Yemen, there might be Sudanese willing to do and die anywhere, being recruited as mercenaries and deployed there. So the Sudanese mercenaries have been fighting on behalf of the forces supported by the Saudis in Yemen. They have been dispatched to protect strategic interests in of Haftar in southern Libya. So there has been regional involvement already in the conflict in Sudan for the past decades. And now there's no point saying that it will spill over to the neighboring countries, and that is what is going to create, exacerbate the conflict here at all. Since its independence in 96, uh, Sudan has had more than 15 military coups and has been ruled by the military by the majority of the time in the Republic's insistence. The military, of course, like in all other countries in third world where military takes over power, says that it is doing so to protect the constitution, to protect the democracy, but that itself is the greatest threat to democracy. And these armed forces are supported by external forces, either neighbors in the region or external forces from the European Union. Uh, the, the burden of Sudanese refugees has alienated many of the countries in Eastern Europe, not only in Eastern Europe, but in European Union, who think that these people who practice a different religion, who look differently, whose color of skin is different, should not be encouraged to come freely. But the, the way this, the, these refugees are treated prejudices the policy making about Sudan totally. The recent clashes which began uh, have now spread across the country. The fighting began by the attack of the rapid uh, support force uh, on the key government uh, positions, airstrikes, airports. Um, 
Now, right now, the Air Force and the Army are involved. Until recently, the leaders of two forces were allies. But now it seems that they are going for broke and there is no hope for a compromise between them. If you look at this map, several things will become clear. So you would have the irregularly, sharply marked boundaries on the western side. You have jig jag on the southern side. You have opening it out on the uh, port uh, Sudan in, on the Red Sea. So it, in a manner of the, the navigation in the Red Sea is affected if by the, this instability and all the neighborhoods, all the neighboring countries you can see are affected. Whether the Central African Republic, whether the South Sudan. Now, population-wise, Sudan may not appear to be a very large country. It ranks ninth um, uh, in Africa. But if you add the southern Sudan population, the Sudanese people would probably move up several notches in the population uh, sweepstakes. Uh, tension between uh, the two forces, the military and the RSF, uh, have been escalating since February through March. And it is a paramilitary organization which has grown out of, as we said, as, as a militia. There is also an involvement of foreign mercenaries who are training these people. The other countries in the region officially align with one or the other to gain control of the mineral resources of the Sudanese. But this um, intensifying of the fighting could cast a shadow over the whole of the Horn of Africa region and experts and diplomats keep warning. But diplomats keep warning whenever this, happened, this was happening in Ethiopia to, to no effect, when the Chinese set up a base in Djibouti to no effect, when the Somalian pirates take over or Al Shabaab is wreaking havoc, there is no response elsewhere. But when it comes down to Sudanese, I think now it is too difficult to shut your eyes to the problem that the whole of Africa is on the boil. Similarly, there have been outbreak of violence in Mali, where again, you have an involvement of Wagner, you have the president who is dictatorial, you also have people who, who have an Islamic threat, who have followed with the fundamental terrorist factions of the Islamic uh, international terrorist groups, uh, is the Islamic Brotherhood or its splinter groups, a policy of living and let live. But basically, whether it's the Western multinational corporations, whether it's a corrupt autocratic indigenous regime, whether it is a foreign uh, power, big power, this seems to be a chessboard where everybody is trying to achieve a position or a strategic position of power where from it can control the resources of this unfortunate country. Let's move over to Lula's Brazil and his bid for uh, the leadership of what should be called a neo NAM. Now, Brazil, uh, the situation started becoming fluid when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and most countries which had earlier belonged to the non-aligned camp, shall we say, uh, took a position which was equidistant between Russia and America. America was all out for helping Ukraine, who would fight till the last Ukrainians, give military assistance to Ukraine, give economic assistance to Ukraine, and try to impose sanctions on Russia. And even China was cautious about supporting Russia to begin with. The war seemed to be going against Russia. The strategy which Putin had thought of a special operation would, would dramatically um, humiliate uh, uh, Zelensky and uh, Kiev would fall, did not quite happen. The Russian army got bogged down, its weakness was exposed. Uh, Putin's unpopularity, of course, doesn't make any difference to him at home because he has a very tight grip on, on his own country. Uh, the public opinion there doesn't really matter. The cost of war which people are playing, he called for a general mobilization, which was opposed. All these things are past. But over the years, what has happened is over the past year, the Russians have gained an advantage on the battlefield, or so it appeared. They they not only managed to keep control of Crimea, they managed to make certain advances and in the Donbass and the Donetsk region, um, the uh, Ukrainians were made to fight very high. The country was devastated. Their industries were ruined. There were threats to their nuclear plants. But however, the non-line movement countries who belong to that faction did not take sides. Many abstained when the vote was taken. Some, only a very few, voted in favor of Russia. But over, a, over the past one year, position has changed. In an economically multipolar context, many non-line 
countries. No longer it is fashionable to use this term though. So you might say new NAM. Uh, they have tried to seek strategic autonomy. They have not blindly followed the American diktats to condemn Russia or to ostracize China. And they say that the West itself is uh, applying double standards. They are dealing with China because they are dependent, their supply chains are dependent on Chinese intermediaries. And the Russians have managed to find an alternative route to sell their oil and gas, which they were selling to, to Europe. So Russians are no longer dependent. They may be cutting prices. They may be not abiding by the cap of the price imposed on their oil. But as long as they can sell their oil to India, to Pakistan, to China, they don't care too much about this one. And also there has been through the courtesy of Turkey, a way has been find, found to sell uh, the Ukrainian grain to reach it to Africa and to Europe. So there is this interesting situation of the emergence of a new NAM. Even the regimes closed or dependent on Moscow or Washington had so far resisted to side with them. But when Lula recently went to China and made this statement that the Chinese should uh, take the initiative to mediate and have a ceasefire in Ukraine, everybody thought he was breaking ranks. But one must not forget that Lula was not breaking ranks. Lula belongs to the vintage of leadership, uh, which was socialistic in Latin America and aligned to Russia. Now, rather than greatly support Russia, it is appealing to another socialist country to exercise whatever control it has over influence it has over Russia. People might even dispute that China should not be referred to as a socialist country anymore. It is state capitalism. It is autocracy of Xi. It is a totally different country uh, than it was at the height of the Cold War when Mao was the leader. In any case, China and the United States represent two biggest trading partners for many countries, and they have to choose one over the other. It is in this context that one must see that China has replaced United States of America as the largest trading partner for Brazil decades back in 2009-2008. And this situation did not change even when Bolsonaro was the president. Now, let's not forget that Brazil is the largest country in the South American continent. It is technologically very sophisticated. It owns the largest geographical chunk of the tropical rainforest. And what happens in that region, the Amazon rainforest, is going to have an impact on the future of mankind because of climate change issues, land use there is changing or not, biodiversity there is being destroyed or not. It also has important minerals like copper and so on. So far, the Americans have thought that the extension of Monroe Doctrine continues in the 21st century, and none of these countries should uh, look beyond the North Americans for either economic support or for strategic security elsewhere. But the aspirations of the, the Latin American people have been time and again uh, frustrated by the operations of multinational corporations or the support given to them by the American government, regardless of whether it's a democratic government or Republican government, their reluctance to treat equitably the either the refugees or settlers or immigrants from Latin America is there and the pressure tactics from Allende's time in Chile to Argentina to, to the Peron to present day uh, Lula Bolsonaro, uh, Venezuela Chavez, the, these countries are looking elsewhere. Even Peru is looking towards China, Peru is looking towards Japan on the Pacific coast. On, on uh, Brazil part, they are looking towards Africa, they are looking towards their metropolitan countries uh, in, Euro, in Europe. So I think uh, the Portuguese at one time were a colonial power, a significant colonial power. Their language is spoken in different parts of the world. So they, they do not necessarily identify with what is fashionable to call these days as the Anglosphere. So I think uh, when the new NAM is emerging, the aspirations of Brazil to lead it seem to be quite natural. This might sound uh, quite odd to Indians where we think that Indians are the natural leaders for the NAM, but we forget that when Nehru was advocating anti-colonialism, anti-racialism, um, peace, nuclear disarmament, anti-imperialism, the world was different. When he was formulating Panchshil, uh, the rift between India and China had not come uh, to surface. And now the world has changed to an extent where some of these regional powers who have aspirations 
of predominance in their own region like Brazil are aspiring for a larger role in the global politics. Whenever the structural changes in the United Nations are talked about, one mentions Brazil, one mentions Indonesia in Southeast Asia. So India is not the only sole uh, candidate for leading the third world. Now, Modi, Prime Minister Modi of India has very hard, tried very hard to give voice to the third world, voice to the global south. And this is with, with the striving is with the goal to achieve the goal of actually regaining India's leadership of the global south, which is the non-lined countries. Now, this new name might be an obstacle in India's ambitions. You, we, in, till very recently in the past, we put great emphasis on BRICS in Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Now, if you see, since the war in Ukraine, Russia and China are very close together. Brazil under Lula is aspiring to play an independent role closer to Russia and China. In which case, where does, where does it leave India? South Africa is not too great a support uh, as it is engulfed by massive corruption, racial strife, law and order problem, and still very much under the control of Western multinational corporations. Uh, the politics there is very instable, law and order is tricky. So Brazil, return of President Lula, it wants to create a group of countries, possibly including India, China, and Indonesia, to mediate in peace talks between Russia and Ukraine. There has there have been people, there have been analysts who have said that India can play a role in this. And they say when Modi said this is not an era for wars, this is what he was striving at. But his advice fell on deaf ears, and the fighting in um, Ukraine has continued, and probably he doesn't want to risk. Uh, India's reputation by making a peace uh, appeal for peace, which falls flat. Macron has made this mistake. Lula seems to be making this mistake. So India is probably playing much too safe. But the risk in playing much too safe is that somebody else might take an initiative and the peace breakthrough or even a ceasefire temporary might be achieved. Uh, China has surpassed, as we said earlier, uh, US as Brazil's main trading partner. And the China has invested uh, US dollar 66.1 billion, according to Brazil Chinese Business Council. Now, average Amazon deforestation soared by 75% during Bolsonaro's regime compared with the previous decade. The Brazilian president today takes a step back when he says that he will be able to revive the American uh, Amazonian rainforest. Lula has made his country's relationship with China a priority, and this gives, and his government, it gives an option to balance American predominance in this whole subcontinent and others from Venezuela. He visited Venezuela. Maduro might uh, support him. Argentinians might support him. And a very young dynamic leadership in Chile might ultimately see him as a natural leader of their, their continent and one step removed from the global south. Uh, Brazil is rich in a variety of natural resources, as we said earlier, is a leading producer of tin, iron ore, and phosphates. It is large deposits of diamonds, manganese, chromium, copper, bauxite, and many other minerals. It occupies roughly half of South America, bordering the Atlantic Ocean, and covers a total area of 8.5 million uh, square kilometers. You can't wish it away. Now let's get back to India's hosting of the SCO. The, India had always laid great hopes on the SCO. When India is hosting the SCO, is a run-up to the larger summit of the G20. But G20 is one off issue. Next year, the presidency will pass on to some other country. It will pass on to Brazil. And after that, India would be a past president. So it is how much mileage it can get, but SCO is a more or less permanent organization. And India has tried to use it uh, to either um, have Russia exercise the restraint on Pakistan or to find a way to the Central Asian republics uh, through which the passage is through, through, through Russia. And India had always hoped that Russia would be in a position as long as it was the senior partner in the relationship of exercising some control, some restraint on China in its adventurous uh, postures against India. But all these, this has changed drastically since Russian intervention in Ukraine. Because China and Russia have drawn closer together, it would be a very naive person who believes that today China can be expected to, Russia can be expected, uh, sorry, to in favor of India when China is committing an aggression or intrusion in Indian territory or trying to encircle India by 
extending its influence aggressively, militaristically in Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, etc. Uh, there have been talks scheduled on April 23rd uh, between India and China. 18th round of border talks between the local commanders was held uh, after five months since the last uh, round of talks in December. But is it will be too much to read uh, optimistically in this round of negotiations because China always delays these, uh, whatever has been negotiated in these talks, these round of talks, they seem to be unending and then it reneges or changes its position. So the strategically important uh, Depsang planes remain a crucial controversial issue. Uh, while both militaries have disengaged from the northern and southern banks in the Pangong So, Gogra area, Hot Spring area, tensions remain in Depsang Plains and Demchok. While trips, uh, the troops of both sides have disengaged, but they remain deployed in forward areas and the situation remains explosive like it suddenly uh, sparked off in Galwan a couple of years back. The Indian de-escalation entails return of all additional troops and equipment to their pre April 2020 positions. However, the China has been very reluctant to accept this because it says that it is it's not going to withdraw from territory uh, after a ceasefire has been effected, which is its own. So the India's hosting of SEO is fraught with very many difficulties. Pakistan did not uh, participate as scheduled in a seminar uh, on the contributions of armed forces to medicine, healthcare, and pandemic response held in Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization, typically attended by members of top leaders, is to be held in July. It is not clear whether uh, the Pakistani Prime Minister uh, Shaba Sharif will attend, but whether he does or not will be a closely watched decision. The political situation in Pakistan is very, very fluid. One doesn't even know whether he would be in place if the courts decide against him and in favor of Imran Khan, unless an agreement is found, uh, arrived at upon the dates of the elections in the near future, the government would be in, his government would be an illegal government in, in Punjab and it would have a cascading effect. The Pakistan's foreign minister, Bilawal Bhutto, has and made that he would attend the Shanghai Cooperation Organization minister, foreign minister's meeting in India in next month. Uh, Bhutto's Azari meeting would be the first by a Pakistani foreign minister in nearly 12 years. The problems remain here also because Pakistan has objected to India holding G20 meetings in Jammu and Kashmir because it says that the whole area is a disputed area and this is a provocation for Pakistan. Uh, all these things you keep at the back of your mind and see what are the prospects for the SCO. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization, chaired by Home Minister Amit Shah on Thursday, again emphasized the priority in the region is economic cooperation among member states. But economic cooperation among member states includes Pakistan. And if Pakistan is reluctant to cooperate, uh, unless the K word, as they say, against Kashmir is put on the front burner, no progress is ever going to be made. If the Russians have an independent uh, forum now to negotiate with erstwhile Central Asian republics and China has a separate uh, channel with Central Asian republics, the SCO is not going to be useful for India for a long time at all. The Defense Minister's uh, conference will soon take place. The earlier there was a National Security Advisors conference which took place. But these are meetings basically reasserting known positions Nothing new, no breakthrough is achieved. The Defense Minister Rajnath Singh will chair the meeting of the Defense Ministers this time and discuss terrorism, regional security, and the security situation in Afghanistan. But it's difficult to see how SCO can be a forum where something concrete can be decided upon which makes a difference to these issues. While India has invited the Defense Minister Faza Asif to the meeting, there is no confirmation as we talk whether he will attend it or not. So we'll say that the SEO prospects remain limited. India should, however, watch uh, carefully in a long distance perspective, a futuristic, what Lula is doing with the new NAM. And of course, what we have to see, most important is how the conflict in Sudan is taking place. Our very active foreign minister has taken immediate steps to bring back Indians, diplomats and civilians by dispatching Air Force plane to there and to have a ship ready in the Port Sudan. Uh, India has done that in the past. India will probably do that in this case also. But will it be enough to safeguard Indian interests 
in a continent which is on the boil once again. Think about this till we meet again next week. Thank you and goodbye. Press end. End for all.